think, I mean, we'll, we'll probably get rolling. I see that Kathy High is on. Kathy, I want to introduce you especially to Gavin. Um, and I also want to thank Kathy High. She's the co-curator of this series. This is called I Ear Presents. It is a series that is um, supported by the Arts Department at RPI and the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Rensselaer, made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. And Kathy High is the head of the Arts Department. Nice. Anything just introducing the Be The Media or hello or? Yeah, hi, and, and Gavin, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks, Branda, for that great introduction. And, you know, we're just really, really honored to have you speak about this process of how this film came about. Um, the film is so important. And, you know, this kind of work with digging through archives is really time consuming and <laughs> exhausting, but so put, you put together such a great story that I just really appreciate it. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing you unpack some of that, what were some of the challenges, how did you push through them, I'm sure there were some, maybe sure. not any, but you know, and um, you know, we just thank you so much for taking the time to talk about the film because as Branda's probably already said, this, this is part of the process of screening things at the sanctuary and with RPI is to have the filmmakers here and to really learn from you you know, how you, how you got this project together and got it out in the world. Happy to do it. Yeah, excited to do thank it. Thank you. That's I have a niece good. at RPI, by the way. That I, I don't know that I ever said that, but I have a... That's have awesome. A yeah. <laughs> I would look us up. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, um, a little more about Be the Media. You know, what we find, especially as documentary filmmakers, is you make a film, you dedicate years to it, you get up in front of an audience, and you are the expert on the content of the film. Yeah. But no one asks you about the filmmaking. <laughs> so this is a really special moment for us to be with the filmmaker and really ask questions about filmmaking, the process, and also with the goal of not being passive viewers of the film, but activating us to become our own media makers. Mm -hmm. uh, we invite you all to come on at seven o'clock and that will be a town hall that's about the subject of the film. There'll be a lot of speakers. Gavin will not be have a lot of space there to talk about uh, his, he will have no space to talk about his filmmaking process. So this is kind of a luxury for him. Um, Gavin, thank you. Yesterday you were so great uh, visiting our classes at RPI. Um, let me just um, give a little timeline on how this is gonna work. Um, we are basically gonna spend the first hour talking to Gavin about the discussion that we said uh, this workshop would be about, about learning about crafting a narrative through dialogue, about the art of editing with archival footage, about learning what it was like to be a first time director, which Gavin was a first time director here, and how he relied on his instincts, how key that was. And in thinking about how you create a framework for a documentary that's designed for impact. And then I just want to share, you won't be rude if you leave, but Gavin has um, graciously agreed to stay on from 5 till 5.30 extra. And that will be a space where he listens to each of you. If you're working on a film or you're working on a radio production, if you're working on a documentary, if you're in the script process or if you're in the post-production process, this will be like a little workshop, a clinic, where he will be the mentor, will go around and give everyone space to talk about their work and ask him for tips and advice. So that's gonna be the process. Let me just quickly say that uh, Gavin, it's very interesting, has 30 years of experience creating award-winning visual effects for feature films. And, and actually it was through being a, a visual effects uh, director that you actually was the main funding of your film, if I'm correct, right? That is correct. <laughs> And in 2013, he was in the audience for a presentation by the cast of Roots when they asked the crowd, what are you doing to advance the cause of racial equality and social justice in the world today? Let the People Decide was born out of that challenge. After six and a half years of production, the film made its successful debut at the 2019 Margaret Mead Film Festival. And now in the COVID age of social distancing, the film is making its impact felt virtually through community screenings such as these. So welcome Gavin Guerra. Thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a real joy to, to be able to talk about this stuff. 
we already have several questions from the audience and um, um, I think um, a lot of the questions um, uh, are talking about um, this idea of post-production, about learning about the crafting of narrative with dialogue and about the art of editing with archival footage. So maybe we could start there and you could just share some of your experience and then we'll just add some of these questions in as you go. Sure. Um, so, so, you know, as a visual effects artist, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what that is, right? So when you see uh, a blockbuster movie like the Avengers or Jurassic Park or whatever, you're pretty familiar with visual effects because it's all the stuff that you see that obviously is not real. But there's also a ton of stuff that I'm used to doing that is uh, invisible, right? I, I change backgrounds, I can, you know, move trees around, change skies, do whatever. It's very time consuming, it's very laborious, it's very artistic, um, and it trains your eye in a very specific way that is uh, different than, than you know, the public, if you will. So I, I went into this project with a certain amount of um, harmful arrogance that like, how hard could this be? Like compared to what I do, how hard could like pointing a camera at some people and getting some newsreel footage and cutting it out, like I'll be done in weeks. Like this, this can't be hard. What I do is hard. This is like a joke, you know, wow did I get a baptism of fire, right? Um, and, and, and it was really humbling, right? To be able to, to um, step into the shoes of someone else and, and really uh, put that hat on. Um, on the other hand, on the flip side of that, you know, as a first time director, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so you don't know enough to be afraid of certain things. You just kind of go head first into things and just do them, you know? And, you know, my, my post-production experience definitely comes in handy because I know how to cut corners or I know what I can get away with visually, maybe in a way that um, other people wouldn't, you know? And plus I have a fairly deep network of contacts of people I can call on for help, you know, if I really, really felt I needed it. Um, you know, most of you, and I'm kind of reading some of these comments, you know, the archival footage aspect of doing, uh, I mean, look, this, this film covers about 60 years, right? It's no joke. It's a, it's a lot of stuff. And, and, you know, what are you going to show? You can't, you know, you, you have to distill it down to certain things. If you're going to make a movie, you can't just keep throwing stuff at the screen. Um, even though some of the stuff you'd like to throw at the screen is exciting or it's, um, you know, impactful, uh, but if it doesn't serve the narrative or it doesn't go with everything else, then you, you got to get rid of it, right? So that's all part of the editing process. But I forget who, who we've spoken to in these various uh, classes, if any of you have heard these stories already, but, you know, mainly um, the way that this worked was the ar archival footage, generally speaking, is in support of your narration, of your of your talking heads. Your talking heads are telling you what happened um, and you really don't want to sit on a talking head for 10 minutes while they're talking, right? You want to be able to give people a visual, a visual uh, experience. This is not a podcast. This is a, this is a movie. So it relies very heavily on the visuals, but it's not just that. So there are two things that, that you need to know. One is you really need two cameras right? Um, for many of my interviews, I only had one. I'd say the first nine interviews, I only had one camera. And those were some pretty important interviews. But what happens then is it makes editing very challenging. Because if they have an um or an uh, or they stumble over their words, and you want to cut it out, you don't want to see that cut. So you have to cover it with something, right? A photograph, a clip, you know, that kind of hides your edits. And typically, if you have two cameras, you can just cut to the other camera. If you don't have two cameras, you better have something, right? So if it's Harry Belafonte, it's like, you know, there's lots of Harry Belafonte stuff you can put up, right? Um, but, you know, putting a picture up of a singer singing isn't necessarily so exciting in a voting rights film. So you, you would find, try to find really meaningful photography or footage that was going with what he was talking about. And so much of what I did, 
it was, it was really interesting because, you know, I, I had hired an editor and uh, cause I, I, I was not an editor, right? It's not, not my thing. Um, I hated everything he was doing, hated it. It wasn't that I hated it. I mean, he was a skilled editor. It just, he just wasn't telling the story that I wanted to be told, right? And I would look at his stuff and I'd be like, yeah, no, that's not quite right. And then he'd go back and do it again. I'd be, yeah, no, you know, and then it's like, I'm a teacher too. I've been teaching visual effects for over 20 years. I, I have this like urge just to grab the mouse out of his hand and go, no, like this, you know, and I would kind of, I would kind of, um, and I'd be, you know what? Why don't I just do this? You know, and I and I would start crafting this rough cut for him, like a like a through line. I'm like, okay, make that nicer. And then he still wouldn't. And I'm like, you know, and finally I just sent him away. You know, I'm like, you know what? I think this would be easier for me because I'm not speaking your language to, to just do this in my language, you know, because I have this in my head and clearly I'm having a hard time articulating it. And I, I, can, I can take blame for that. I can say it's my fault, right? I'm not a skilled enough communicator in that medium to explain what I want, right? If it was a visual effects thing, I can speak that language very well. For an editor, we were having a real hard time and I really felt like I was wasting money. Um, ultimately, I think he stiffed me for about $5,000, but that's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother story. But you know, so I, what I did was I, I, I did what I thought made sense, right? And so I took all of my interviews and I had a gazillion of them and I, and I broke them down into subjects and I strung them out into like, you know, act one, I had a string out of act one that was like two and a half hours long of just people talking. And they were talking about what they were talking about and I grouped them into sections. And then I was able to, you know, kind of, this is what we were talking about at the head of this, like weaving dialogue, right? Between these people who were talking about the same thing. They were talking about, you know, uh, the summer project in 1964. And so someone would say, um, you know, we had this system, this, this uh, wide area uh, uh, telegraph system that we had to check in every hour. If we didn't check in every hour, we knew something was wrong. And then I would cut to somebody else talking about the wide area telegraph system saying, and when we didn't hear from them at five o'clock, we knew that there was a problem. So you can start to sort of have continual thought. Um, even though these people were interviewed at different times and at different locations, you can make it almost seem like they were, they were all kind of having a discussion with each other about the same stuff, right? And I found that to be really compelling because it, 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 was, it was becoming seamless, right? Because they were almost of one mind. And so then you could also use cuts that way, right? So instead of having a second camera, I have a second person, right? So if Brenda's talking to Kathy, or you know, they're each talking about the same thing, and Brenda trips over a sentence, I can kind of find Kathy saying something similar and just cut right to her, right? And then that will pick it up and it'll kind of sound like one continuous thought, even though it's from two different people, right? And so then you're trying to sort of, you're trying to get from A to B, right? You're trying to get from the kidnapping of these kids to the discovery of their body. And you have like eight people talking about it. And that's a wealth of, of information. And so you can pull from different people, different emotions, different recollections. Some people speak to uh, uh, their personal point of view. Some people talk about how the, the authorities were responding to it. Um, then you can always find a piece of archival footage to sort of get in the way. I had this really, I can't even explain it. This is sort of the instinct that I was talking about, about like how many seconds of talking head I could have on there at one time before I had a cut to something like I would just kind of look at it almost with the sound off and go oh I'm sick of looking at that guy you know what I mean and I would I would cut to a piece of footage or I would cut to a graphic or I would cut to a photo but like there's like a threshold for staring at someone's face that I felt like it got to be too much of a lecture or too much of a of a of a you know classroom thing and less of a movie um, but the film, you know, if I'm being self-critical, it, it suffers from not being very filmic, 
you know, it doesn't have a lot of verite footage. You're not chasing people around with cameras a lot. Uh, it's more of an educational experience and a history kind of uh, through line. And so I felt it very important to keep it snappy as much as I could because I didn't want people to lose interest. And one of the uh, responses I often get from people is, wow, that was a lot. Like that was a lot. Like, you know, you, 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 know, you packed a lot in there. So Dave Dennis, who's a civil rights icon who is in the film, <laughs> when I saw, he saw it for the first time, he just looked at me and went, I don't know how you got all that in there. Like that was amazing. You know, he was just so impressed that I was able to sort of really get as much information into the film as I could. And of course, I cut out so much stuff. So, but the archival footage, um, you know, is, is a lifeline, right? If you have, especially on historical stuff, right? Because that's what archival footage sort of means. Um, sorry, there's a plane going overhead. If you have archival support that's kind of like gold right you, you sort of if you find that perfect piece of footage that is sort of showing exactly what you're talking about you almost can't wait to get to that part in the edit because you're going to drop in that piece of footage that people are going to go whoa you know like there's that one shot of the police bouncing this guy off the street you know um when i came across that footage i was like um, people are going to respond to that you know um, when, when you get to, uh, you know, the, the, the part say where Reverend Barber and, and his, his people are getting arrested in the, uh, in the state house, I'm like, you know, that's a really impactful, <laughs> that was kind of funny, not for nothing. That was the first time I met Reverend Barber was that day, right? The day that he, they all got arrested at the state house in North Carolina. And I had spent the day with them at this church um down the street from the state house where they were all prepping for this big march and they knew they were going to get arrested this was not a uh, oh, oh dear we're getting arrested they, they came prepared to get arrested right um but i as a filmmaker just i, I didn't know that this was happening that day it was just kind of like happenstance that i happened into this and i got there and i was like whoa this is great they're getting arrested maybe there'll be fire hoses and dogs you know what i mean like like i was hoping for like really crazy visuals <laughs> as it was you know it was great enough of, because you know conflict equals drama right and so if you have conflict um you're 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 really elevating your 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 piece you know um and then and i, I haven't told this to you guys yet um that night, anything to anyone feel free to tell anything that you've said before okay uh so that night you know after they had all gone to jail uh i didn't stick around for them getting out of jail they got out, most of them got out of jail that night but um i drove home to uh, i was staying at a friend's house in washington dc so i had a long drive from raleigh north carolina to washington dc and i'm driving home and the news is on and that was the night that that psychopath murdered those people in South Carolina in that church. And I just won't say his name because I never elevate his name, but he murdered those nine people in that church to try to start a race war. And like my the hair stood up on my body because, you know, if he was looking to kill a, an influential black preacher and he lived in North Carolina instead of South Carolina, that could have easily been me in that church. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was just that close. Uh, of a bullet that I felt like this is not fun and games. This is, this is, this is real stuff, you know? And as I was kind of giddy about all the footage I got um, because it was like a show, you know? And then that really brought it home to a very different level that um, some people don't know that this is a show, you know, this is, this is, this is real. And um, so that definitely put a, a, a damper on my, on my day, you know, and I spoke with Reverend Barber about it afterwards. And, you know, he, he was, they were all like in jail. They got the news on a cell phone and they were just like devastated that, that, you know, that day really was a kind of a triumph for them, you know, um, in civil disobedience and it turned into something else anyway. So you know, getting that footage, you know, getting that in the can, that is like, there's just such a sense of, wow, I have a nugget of gold here that I can, slug into my movie and build a scene around right so oftentimes 
your dialogue uh, that you're weaving will drive the process. But if you find that piece of footage, um, you will you will make room for that footage in your film because you know that, like for instance, I don't know if everyone here has seen the film. There was that moment, uh, I think it was early last year, my cut was pretty much locked, right? Um, my, 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 I knew I was premiering in October. It might've been June or, or, or spring of 2019. And the Atlantic uncovered this footage or, or audio tapes of Ronald Reagan talking to Richard Nixon, calling black people monkeys, right? And I had a whole section of my film about kind of the, the, the subversive racist policies of Ronald Reagan and everybody from the Reagan administration I talked to, it was almost like the Manchurian candidate. They kept saying, Ronald Reagan doesn't have a racist bone in his body, right? They all reflexively had this line that they kept saying and then this tape comes out I'm like I think I found that bone you know <laughs> it's it's right here where he calls black people monkeys you know and I and I I had to make room in my film for that because that that like you can't not put that in the film right so you just sort of had to like wedge it open and slug it right in there um let me ask you actually you had mentioned this before but structurally the film evolved uh, really substantively from the beginning to the end. It wasn't even the film you thought. That's right. Could you talk yeah. about that evolution and also the role of serendipity, which is you brought up with the barber uh, scene. And did your ideas of audience change as you changed the structure of your film? Through so, the that, those are all really good questions. So yes, that, that is true. The film I made is not the film I set out to make. Uh, and I, I wonder if that's, often the case. I mean, this is my first film, but I, I sort of have a feeling that films uh, react to events on the ground um, quite a bit. So I was interviewing a lot of uh, civil rights leaders and activists. In uh, 2014 was the 50th anniversary of the Summer Project. So I went down to Jackson, Mississippi, and I interviewed a bunch of people there. Uh, I got to hobnob with a lot of a lot of, uh, of people who were veterans of the movement, and then I found out that Stanley Nelson, uh, who is the renowned civil rights documentarian for PBS, uh, who's won basically every documentary award alive, you know, around, he was making a film on Freedom Summer, and I, I was like, shit. <laughs> I mean, like, how am I going to compete with that, right? I'm interviewing all the same people he's interviewing. He's, you can't tell the Bob Moses story without telling the Freedom Summer story. Uh, he's got a million dollars and a distribution contract with PBS, and I have my little ragtag team. So, um, you know, it, it forced me to think about uh, the arc of my film a little differently. And ju just, you know, not too long before that, uh, was the Shelby versus uh, Holder gutting of the Voting Rights Act. And it occurred to me as Reverend Barber, I hadn't even met Reverend Barber yet, uh, I wasn't embedded with the NAACP, that these Moral Monday movements uh, and, and struggles over voting rights today were actually more interesting than, than talking about Freedom Summer then. Because that story has been told, right? That story has been told quite a bit, in fact, and and well, right? I mean, everything from Eyes on the Prize to to whatever Stanley Nelson was doing, these were really well done historical accounts of of that time. So yeah, I think every twenty years or so, you need to have someone redo that, right? Because those films get lost you know, to the, to the record and the new generation needs to sort of be made aware. So I felt there was definitely a place to make that film, but if Stanley was going to do that, and I was in contact with him after that, I reached out to him, we talked about it, you know, and I, and I, and I said, uh, I'm going to go this way and I'm going to make this a then and now piece. I am going to, I am actually going to try to connect the dots between what Bob Moses was doing in Mississippi and everybody in the, you know, SCLC and SNCC and CORE and all those groups down south were doing then, how that dovetails with uh, the Moral Monday movement, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, which started, you know, in 2013 as well. Uh, all these things were coming out. There was, a, there was a big sort of resurgence, especially of youth activism, 
right? Uh, in, in around that. Ferguson was, was not too long after that as well, right? So there was this big sort of push that was driven largely by social media. And I thought, wow, this is really similar to what SNCC and CORE and those guys were doing back then, just with a different, a different tactic. And so I set out to sort of really um, show how we got here, right? How did we end up you know, back in the streets yelling about racism, yelling about voter suppression, and why are we still having these discussions 50 years on, right? I mean, most people would say, oh, we have a black president, you know, racism's dead, and yet here we are, right? So, so that became much more the focus, and it was a much bigger focus, right? It made my job a lot harder um, because I had to spend so much time and really thread that needle in a way that, that I was hoping would bring the viewer from then to now. And so even if, it, you know, some people pick up on it well and some people don't, but if you watch the first minute, the intro to my film, it outlines the then and now aspect of it, right? You have Donald Trump saying, make America great again. Then you have Ronald Reagan, who he stole that line from saying, let's make America great again. That was Ronald Reagan's campaign slogan in 1980 was make America great again. So even Trump's, you know, I, his the ideas that stick aren't his ideas, right? Law and order was a Nixon thing. He's running on that now, right? It was George Wallace. So all these old ideas are now being brought to the front again. And so I tried to sort of show that even just to set up the film in that first minute that this was a then and now narrative that we were going to see then and we were going to see now. And boy, you know, we're having the same conversation. So that, yeah, that, that was a torturous time for me, right? I mean, I was a little deflated that, um, that Stanley was doing, you know, it's like, you know, you, know, you, you feel like you're doing something uh, big and important, you know, and then like, you know, Robert De Niro decides to make the same movie. And you're like, oh, okay, you know? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I, I should do something else, right? And so you really, you really have to roll with that stuff, right? I mean, I had all this great footage, so this just happened two weeks ago, right? I swear to God, I'm in talks with like Netflix and Amazon and all these people about distributing my film and fricking Stacey Abrams drops a, drops a voting rights film that Amazon bought in January. It turns out it sucks, excuse me, but um, it, 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 part of, I mean, I'm being facetious. I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad that there's another voice amplifying this issue, right? But you have to sort of be able to to roll with those punches, right? That someone's always gonna, there's gotta be enough room for your vision in there. And I was pretty sure that nobody was dumb enough to make a movie that covered as much stuff as I was, right? That, that to make that 60 year arc is, is such a heavy lift. Um, you know who did a decent job of it was Ava DuVernay in 13th, right? Cause she sort of had a very similar arc about the uh, industrial prison system. Um, for black people that I had for voting. And it followed a lot of the same narrative. Um, you, know, you know, there's a lot of overlap between our movies that way, as far as the, the dialogue. And I was pretty, again, but she got a million dollars to do it. You know what I mean? And, um, but it's, it's, it's tough. It's a real, and, and, you know, especially because archival footage is expensive. It is really prohibitively expensive. I really got to say I wasn't prepared for that. Um, the only thing more expensive than archival footage is music, right? If you're going to like get a Jimi Hendrix song or a Frank Sinatra song in your movie, like that's like ridiculous amounts of money. But going to NBC News and getting, um, you know, four minutes of archival footage cumulatively uh, for festival rights, you're looking at about $32 a second to do um, worldwide distribution rights, you're looking at, you know, close to $100 a second. So a 10 second clip is a thousand bucks, you know? And then if you have talent in it, if you have Walter Cronkite or somebody, they almost double that, right? And so um, you gotta, you know, you gotta be really judicious about how many seconds you're, you're gonna be able to use for that. Now, there is public domain archival footage. Um, and then there are some crafty people who are pretty slick about licensing you free footage. Um, 
they're like aggregators. They sort of collected all this free footage under one roof and it becomes like a one-stop shopping place. And for that convenience, you pay them X, right? And it, it's worth it, honestly, right? Like if you're gonna give them a hundred bucks for a clip and you have to spend uh, uh, you know, two days finding that on your own, um, the hundred bucks is worth it, right? I mean, because the two days of your time is worth more than a hundred dollars. So you have to sort of make those those trade-offs, you know, with your eyes wide open and, and know what, what's free and what's not free and what, what needs clearance and what doesn't need clearance. And, you know, then you hire a lawyer and he charges you more than anything else, um, you know, for what you can use for, uh, we haven't discussed fair use yet, you know, the idea of, um, you know, basically stealing footage and saying, this is, I'm making this public domain because, it's out there in the ether and is uh, germane to my uh, essential to my film. Um, you know, uh, so, <laughs> so the woman at NBC told me, don't call me up and tell me you're going to fair use something. Okay. That, that's like, just don't do it. She said, just do it and make me come after you because I'm not going to come after you right? That's kind of what she said. But if you actually are dumb enough to call me and tell me that you're going to steal from me, I, I sort of have to, you know, alert the legal department and they'll, they'll come up to you. But if you're going to like use a three second clip or a four second clip, um, I, you know, no one's going to really come after you, right? But uh, so, so she basically gave me license to, to do that. Uh, but a lot of the stuff I got wasn't out there, meaning that it was in the NBC archives and it had big watermarks on it, or they had to transfer it from the original film. And there's no getting around that, right? I mean, if, if you need them to give you that footage to get the big NBC logo off the middle of the frame, you got to pay them, you know? And, and uh, so I, I, I really just, the, there used to be more like the Wild West, I'm told. There were a lot of different uh, archival houses. Um, they're, like everything else, are getting swallowed up by the bigger players. So you're, you're getting like Getty Images has like bought so many collections now that they own a big chunk of stuff. It's mostly photographs um, go through Getty. Then you have, um, I think it's Wazi Digital, like has the CBS archives. Um, and maybe ABC. ABC doesn't have much of an online archive. CBS and NBC have really strong online news archives. And NBC Universal um, is a big player in that game. They, they have a lot of stuff. And then the, 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 some of the best footage I found was on Fox Movie Tone, which was old newsreel footage from 20th Century Fox. Um, and they're just getting started. So they're actually pretty, pretty happy to have you use their stuff. Um, national archives i used to always use national archives before the digital age that's right so the national archives have now punted which really upset me right because uh they will not let you know whether or not anything is copyrighted or not they, they refuse to they refuse to uh give you provenance it's like uh here it is use it at your own risk um we don't know where this came from you know, we have it stored here. And then you do a little research and you find out it is a CBS news clip. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, so then you find out like, okay, you know, should I use this? Should I not use this? Um, but I will tell you the greatest, uh, one of the greatest resources that you could use as a historian, uh, and not that I count myself as a historian, but I was acting as one here, are presidential libraries, right? So anything that the government snaps with a camera belongs to you, okay? And that's from NASA to, to the White House press secretary. So they have gazillions of photographs um, because there's somebody that follows the president around all day with a camera, right? So they generally, in their libraries, in their archives, there is a WHS index, um the white house something i don't know what the s stands for uh and you can just do a search right you can say you know nixon with uh judge rehnquist right so you're like william rehnquist richard nixon and they'll give you like a 
a list of all the photographs they have of William Nixon with, with William Rehnquist, and they might be contact sheets. They might be like little, little thumbnails. But you know what? All you got to do is ask and they'll, they'll print them for you. Now they'll cost like $20 each or $15 each. I mean, in, in my world, that's free, right? If I can get, if I can get a really high res, beautiful print for, you know, for worldwide use for 15 bucks, that's a win, right? So I got a lot of Nixon pictures. I got a lot of uh, Reagan pictures. Uh, the George Wallace stuff I got was from the Alabama archives, right? So Alabama, most states have like a historical society, right? And they're really good about working with you. Um, the ones that are tough are, so universities often have um, collections right? They'll have the Gavin Guerra photography collection or something like that. And the thing is, is like, they're happy to share it with you. But if you're going to use it for film, you know, the photographer wants some money. And I get it, right? Especially if he's alive. Um, so then there's this like kind of whole back and forth where you got to just a lot of emails, a lot of contracts, you know, you get it, it might only end up being $75, it might be $150. But it's just a lot of red tape, as opposed to going to the historical societies or the presidential libraries, which are kind of like that. Um, and then every now and then you get a photographer who is just so cool. And uh, Herbert Randall comes to mind. Uh, I used a couple of his photographs and he, he's like 90 and he lives on Long Island and I get him on the phone and he's like, he goes, yeah, man, you know, use what you want. You know, you can give me a dollar or two if you want. And I said, but it's no big deal. And he said, you know, he said, power to the people. <laughs> he gave me his photographs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he was, he was still a civil rights warrior, you know, in his mind, like these photos were for this purpose. So go have fun with them, you know? And then there was one guy who was like, you will not use my photograph without crediting me on any aspect of your film or I will sue you, right? So it, it was like, a, it, you just have to sort of walk that tightrope when you're doing this stuff. Um, let, me, let me just, um, uh, let's transition. Oh, well, first of all, before we leave the archival discussion, does anyone have anything that they really wanna ask about archives to Gavin before we move on about using archival material? I know that there was the question of what do you do with 70, 70 um, hours? How do you structure it in? Yeah, um, that, that was an archival. Those are my interviews. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for all the archival sharing. I actually just found the presidential uh, websites, and it's good to know that that's an easy and uh, good resource um yeah. because yeah that's not heavily advertised and i don't know if uh trump has one considering that almost everything went offline well, once he took office the only they only generally open the libraries after they're out of office so oh, okay yeah because it seems in the past yeah. yeah yeah so the lyndon johnson uh library was awesome and one re also uh you know, because he came after Kennedy and they, and so Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon all recorded their conversations on the, like they were bugging their own phones. All of those conversations are available for download, right? So in the section of my film where they find the bodies of Schwerner, Goodman and Cheney and the FBI is calling and for the president and the president's calling um, J. Edgar Hoover, all of those phone calls came out of the Lyndon Johnson archives, right? I just had to. I just had to find them. I mean, I knew. I, I I knew the dates. I knew what like you know, and I had to go through every single phone call and find out which ones were going to be because I knew like it was going to be August fourth or whatever that date was. I knew kind of the 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 two or three day window I was looking for, but I went through every White House log and I was like, yes, I found it. You know what I mean? And I downloaded it and right into my film, right? And that's that's like gold. Like that's what I'm telling you. When you when you find that that eureka moment that you sort of got it and you can see how it's going to work in your film in your head as soon as you get it that that is is one of the really high points of making the film you really feel like you nailed it at that point steve did you have a question yeah quick question i'm just wondering um do you have to go to the libraries or is it possible to do this from the comfort and relative safety of your home comfort all in, uh almost all internet now they they do allow you to come in and 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 you know make appointments and kind of do that stuff as well 
um, excuse me, I didn't have the luxury of doing that, right? Because they're, they're all, they're usually in the home state of the, of the president. So Reagan's in California, Johnson's in Texas, uh, you know, Carter's in Atlanta. I, I, you know, I just wasn't going to do that. And so um, they, they do have archivists. They are, we are the digital age for the most part. Uh, they also generally have a gallery of like greatest hits photos, you know, like ones that they use all the time. And then if you can go one level deeper, you can get into the index and the better libraries have a search index where you can type in names and kind of try to cross reference. And then you can do it much the way um, I did, the, I did the, the phone call thing is if there's an event that you know happened on a date, right? you can kind of go into those archives and kind of just like bracket that date and look for a photograph that might have been taken at that time, right? So one date that really vexed me um, was when Reagan was at the Neshoba County Fair campaigning, uh, you know, in Mississippi. It was his first campaign rally after he got the nomination, officially secured the nomination. And it was right where Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney were murdered. And he was talking about states' rights to a group of Mississippi guys, you know, and man, was that hard. I mean, I, I had such a hard time finding that moment, right? And here's the thing, I got NBC, NBC and CBS were both there, right? And I got some footage from NBC where it was like him standing at the podium and talking, but from the back. And then there was some from CBS where it was like perfectly framed. They had him. He was going through his speech. And then right before he got to the part I needed, the tape cut, you know, and I didn't, I didn't get it. And I was so devastated because I, I worked so hard and I made so many calls and I asked so many people to sort of pull that footage for me finally got it and it just wasn't there. So what I ended up doing was I used the footage that they gave me, right? Of him talking at the podium. It's kind of B-roll footage of him talking. But when he had to say, I believe in state's rights, I only had the audio. And I had the audio from like an audience member, you know, it was well before cell phones, but somebody was recording it and it was kind of scratchy. So I just took some of the B-roll footage of him from behind and I put the audio on top of that as if he was there saying it. And, you know, I kind of fudged it together. Uh, I didn't feel like that was disingenuous. I mean, it was, it was that moment in time. I just didn't have a picture of his face mouthing those words. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, you, you, really, you really dig deep on that stuff when you're, when you're, I was pretty careful about, and I'll wrap this up because I know we have a lot more to talk about. I was careful about trying not to mix, um, events. Like I wouldn't put uh, an Alabama march in my Mississippi section, right? Even though that might have been similar, it might have been like, you know, dogs and fire hoses. If it wasn't that thing, I didn't want to show it as that thing, you know? And I, I was pretty confident that I could at least find a still frame or a, or a photograph or a newspaper headline of that moment. And if I couldn't, uh, I did some animation. I just did some, some pretty, you know, rudimentary um, animation to sort of fill in the blanks because I, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to, for lack, I mean, not to denigrate anyone. I didn't want to Michael Moore it. You know what I mean? I didn't want to sort of start putting things in different places and mixing my timelines if I could avoid doing that. So a quick follow-up. Uh, you said you can do this from the comfort of your home. Is there a meta search engine that you can just put in uh, what you're looking for, or do you actually have to go to the sites of the archives and search each one of them? Uh, yes, <laughs> is the answer. So there is a meta search engine through the Library of Congress that will link you to the White House press archives, right? And that will get you that WHS dash whatever thing I was saying. Typically, the libraries of the presidents will have a shortcut to that, those years of their of their presidencies, right? So the Carter years being 77 to 81 or whatever, you know, like they'll kind of help you bracket that or they'll bring up their own search engine that will be a front end to the, uh, the Library of Congress one. And honestly, I found their libraries to be more usable. I found the Library of Congress one to be a little um, obtuse. It was a little hard to sort of navigate. 
not surprisingly. <laughs> Well, we have about 10 minutes left. And I mean, I just, it's, you know, clearly you are passionate about being a filmmaker and a documentary maker, and it's your first time. And, um, you know, I know you told the story of you, you, uh, you work, uh, yesterday I heard you tell the story of how you work nine to five as a visual effects director, and then you come home, you hang out with your family for dinner for a few hours, and then you start the real work from it's three in the morning, right? Exactly. Three a.m., right? Yeah. And that's yeah. the passion work, right? Where you throw your whole being into it. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to each of the people here um, in this workshop, and you know, like what that experience is like. Just you know. Uh, this life transforming experience of becoming a documentary filmmaker and if you have any advice or words of wisdom after going yeah, I, do, I do actually and the first the, the most important thing that i can say to that is that the subject matter has to mean something to you i mean my job my job the, you know I, I i i do commercials mostly right i mean i sell toilet paper and toothpaste and as much as that needs to be sold it, it doesn't it doesn't really motivate me after 30 years so much anymore. Like I can't wait to get up and do that scope commercial. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't really thrill me so much. Right. But when you sink your teeth into a project that actually means something to you, that, that you feel, um, you know, even, even in a self-centered way uh, is important or makes a difference to yourself or others. Um, it's not that hard to stay up till three in the morning doing it. In fact, you look forward to those nights of, of digging through the footage and, and, <laughs> and going on that treasure hunt for that piece of archival footage um, or scheduling that one more interview. So this is kind of like a thing. Like if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a, a, a four minute sequence of Branda talking about documentary filmmaking and I've, you know, I've, I've interviewed her twice and I got four hours of footage with her, but there's still a hole. You know, like I'm, I'm still missing something that's not quite there. I'll have to figure out how to fill that hole. I better call Kathy. Kathy might have something to say about that. And then she can fill that hole, right? So it becomes, you know, this sort of puzzle that you're putting together. And, and it, it's, 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 I don't know if that's a mindset. Like you have to be that kind of person that likes doing that. I am. I mean, it turns out I am, right? And I really enjoyed um, pulling it all together. Like that to me was, was so gratifying, especially as a visual person, to be able to make what I felt was a, was a visually compelling movie that was, that was full of um, maybe history that uh, a lot of people might not have known. So yeah, that's about, so you gotta care, right? If you don't, I mean, if it's work, um, then, then that should be your day job. Right, and and you should try to you should try to get paid to do it. Uh, I I I did not have financing. I had a little bit of public financing. You know, I did a Kickstarter at the very beginning. I raised about twenty thousand um, dollars from that. Uh, that was a fraction of what I needed to, fill, to 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 make this film. But selling toothpaste and toilet paper was enough to sort of finance the rest of of the movie as much as I could. So I used, you know, whatever I had left over from feeding my family. I would, you know shove some money into the film if I needed to pay somebody a sound editor or a uh, my, my my music was original music so I, I hired a guy to, to to make the music who's who's a pro uh I I turns out I suck at doing sound right of like you know miking people like that's a thing right I mean that's really important um you know I, I thought okay I can hear it in my headphones it must be good and then you sort of put it all together and you realize everybody's all over the place and it all sounds like crap. Um, so someone told me much later, I wish they had told me earlier, that if you're on a budget, you know, almost you'd be better weighting your budget 70-30 in favor of sound, right? Because people are much more forgiving of crunchy video than they are of crunchy audio. <laughs> like crunchy audio weighs on people in a way that is not good. So, um, Anyway, I, 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 I can't stress enough that if you're going to live with a project for six and a half years the way I did, uh, and actually it's now over seven years uh, just doing this stuff, uh, it better be something that you like talking about. It better be something that you um, are not resentful of doing, right? Because otherwise you're never going to see it through. 
Any last questions before we move on to individual people getting feedback from Gavin? Do you have your next big project lined up? I have a couple of little projects lined up uh, and they're offshoots of this one, right? Um, so uh, one, one big storyline that I, I couldn't make because I didn't, I didn't have the archival footage. I didn't have any photographs. I didn't have any footage. It was an amazing story that I have a lot of people talking about, but I didn't have any visual support for. Um, I'm going to try and make a short out of that. Um, and, and it was a, it was a, it was a student-led walkout that um, indirectly, actually directly, led to. SNCC giving up direct action. Now, so direct action is what they call like the sit-ins or the freedom rides or when they sort of get in your face um, and, and really try to antagonize you through their nonviolence. Um, and so what was happening in Mississippi was they would throw you in jail for 30 years, right? And unless you had the money to bail everybody out and do these court fights, uh, Mississippi was not the place to do direct action. And so they switched over to voter registration because that was federally protected. Uh, yeah. If you were being arrested doing voter registration, uh, you can get remanded to federal court and you had some room to operate. But that walkout was such a big deal um, and led to so many different things, but I couldn't put it in the movie because I didn't really have uh, the support. And then quickly, one photograph in my film is of this woman named Fannie Lou Hamer and she's pointing her finger. And it's a really powerful photo. And it was by this guy named Al Clayton, who took the photo. His daughter sent me uh, contact sheets of a bunch of his stuff. Like, oh, I have all this other stuff, right? This was amazing. It was a black and a white child playing together in a field, uh, climbing over some lumber. They were, they were, um, they were just like being kids. They were like five or six, right? And it was such a nice little moment of this black and white child playing together. It was sort of this interracial uh, uh, thing that was like in 1971 or something. And then the punchline is it turned out that that wood that they were playing on was being turned into crosses to burn that night at a clan, at a clan rally, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was this kind of really ironic moment because you know the, the men were there watching these kids play and it was okay for their white kid to play with this black kid uh until sundown when they put the hoods on and set the whole thing on fire right so i'm, I'm gonna make a a short movie out of those photographs uh as well so those those two things are sort of uh next up for me kathy last question and then we'll move on to the students yeah uh, my question may be um past its, its moment but um you know, when you're working on something that's this long, it's really hard to keep all the parts in play in your kind of in your head. And I know that whenever I've worked on longer things, documentaries in the past, I've had like a, like a wall with, you know, little tags on it or something so that I could literally look at a timeline and try to figure out like maybe this should come before that or instead of after. Were there any tricks that you found in terms of coming up with how you wanted to structure the sort of overall film? You've so, got so many great parts to it. Thank you. Um, so I, I, so the, that, that methodology was presented to me, right? Uh, mostly with uh, transcripts and cue cards, right? People were really into transcribing interviews, cutting out things, and, and it just didn't work for me. I, 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 I found that to be an extra step that was bothersome to my brain. Um, so I, I kept the timeline very fluid in my editing program. And I worked modularly. That's a word I have trouble saying. I worked modularly. Um, so I would, I would, when I strung out my timeline and I had everybody speaking about the same things, I really spent a lot of time on that timeline, thinking about what stories were the most impactful, what stories were the most uh, spoke to multiple generations, right? Like what, what, what really was the then and now? And then I would ask myself questions, like you know does this answer that question? And if not, do I need to add another section? So that's like how those little sections about, you know, is this race or partisanship? You know, like I had a whole little section about that. You know, there was a whole section about um, 
one of the things that really bothered me about the film, making the film, was that I had to assume knowledge of people, right? And that's always the worst thing. It's like, does your audience know what you know? And the answer is almost always no, right? I mean, like, you, you can't assume that they know what the hell you're talking about. So I had to explain what the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was and how that came to be. I had to explain the Voting Rights Act, right? Like what's section four, what's section five, what's section two? Like that's kind of boring stuff, but you can't get away with not, with not explaining it because then people get lost in the weeds of, of what you're talking about. You know what I mean? So it was always me watching the film and going, and then what? Like, okay, now what do I do? Okay, no, <laughs> it, was, it was more of it, more like that in my head than, than on a wall, you know, so. Totally, that's so great. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that, that was really good. Sure. We're gonna switch to our um, kind of um, uh, uh, clinic spot. And Steve Pierce, who is the director of the Sanctuary for Independent Media, is going to bring up the first project slash question. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll keep it brief. We're, uh, a number of our volunteers are working on a documentary about a hazardous waste incinerator across the river from us that started 50 years ago uh, as a uh, aggregate manufacturer. They mined shale and made you know building products. And sometime in the 70s, they started burning toxic waste to fuel their, in, their uh, kiln. And now in 2020, they're not an aggregate manufacturer. They claim they are, but what they actually are is a hazardous waste incinerator in a residential neighborhood in the New York State Capitol. And uh, we've been working on it. We have a lot of, doc we have a lot of uh, original interview footage that one of our producers has made, but we don't have any documentary footage. We don't really know what Norlight looked like in the 50s. We don't know what the story was when they opened, what people believed about them. And I think the story really is about how the, the community has been deceived and that we're being uh, poisoned by this plant that was never approved by anybody uh, and is continuing to operate on, on the, uh, on the uh, subterfuge, uh, that there's something that they're not. So anyway, we, we really need some footage uh, to, you know, to give it some texture and to make it, you understand that this has been going yeah. on for half a century. Yeah. But it's super hard to find. I Google and Google and Google and I can't find anything. I can't find much of anything except in newspaper archives. There's some stuff going back to the beginning of the internet. And then it's difficult to find stuff uh, easily. Um, and uh, the, the stuff that I would do if it wasn't the COVID panic would be to go around poking into the historical society, poking into the library. But it's, it's really difficult now to get out and find yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I'm hoping there's a way to do it online, but just Googling it isn't doing it. Yeah, sometimes, you know, Google searching can be so maddening, right? Because no matter what you type in, you get the same six re responses and you're like, oh, I already looked at that one. Oh, I already looked at that one. Um, some things that are a little bit outside the box maybe are looking at uh, public archives for land surveys. You know, uh, you get a lot of photographs of just, you know, town surveys, right? Like, oh, that's what this plant looked like in 1943, you know, or whatever it is, that wouldn't necessarily come up any other way. Uh, you can find that in the, in the public record of um, just for tax documents, right? Because they, they take pictures of the buildings to assess uh, uh, land value. <laughs> so you can go to the public archives of whatever town you're in, presumably, and find that stuff. But uh, other than that, I think you're, you're onto it with, with newspaper articles. Uh, I use quite a bit of headlines, and you saw that when I, I when I couldn't do anything else, I I would I would I would draw. I would have animations, you know, that would uh, art was the way I would kind of play with pictures. But you know, all you can do is all you can do. You know, if there's no footage, there's no footage, and then and then we're kind of stuck more with a with a with a a wordy story than a visual story. And so finding out how to make the visuals um is 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 the trick so i mean you're going to need as many still photographs as you can get um mm -hmm. from that time i mean you want you're going back 50 years you know so hopefully there's something right i would think that there's got to be there's got to be some photos out there of that is this a how long is this piece going to be oh it depends who you talk to uh i i think it should be short i think the story itself could warrant a full-length documentary but i don't we don't really have the resources to do it but you know, I'm thinking of 
there are lots of local news stories because every few years the the residents rise up and demand change. <laughs> They're given some sort of bone and they quiet down again and then 10 years later it's happening again. And so there were rallies and there were complaints and there were fires and I'm sure it was covered in the news but probably a lot of it um, was on film and um, you can get that stuff though. If you if you know who your new local news organization is, WW whomever, you know, you can call them directly and just say, look, you know, uh, and again, it's really helpful to know the dates, right? So it's really helpful to know that this rally happened on July 10th, you know, 1981, so that if you send them looking for a tape that they know what they're looking for. Um, otherwise, because most of that stuff will not be digitized, you know, uh, you're right, and it's going to need to be transferred. Um, and they will generally charge you a screening fee to do that, right? Um, they're not gonna do it for free. So you have to know what you're looking for just to, just to save money on your end um, if you're gonna go on a fishing expedition to, to, to do that. That's what I was doing with that Reagan stuff, right? None of that stuff was digitized. I had to go and kind of say, it has to be in this window. Can you digitize these tapes? And I got a lot of great stuff, but it ultimately crapped out right before the useful part. But you know, if you have a local news station, they generally have crappy videotape of stuff lying around. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes they tape over them. Sometimes they throw them out. You know, but it's it's worth it's worth an effort to do that. But man, I don't I don't envy you that. That's that's a that's a really that's like a question almost that gets asked at the beginning of the production is how much visual support do you have? What are the pictures? Right? What are the pictures? And I had people quiz me on that early on. Uh, a friend of mine who was a, a sports producer um, kind of sat me down one day and said, look, you know, don't go, don't go down a hole too deep without having the, uh, the imagery to back it up because, you know, like I said, it's a visual medium. So th those are lessons I learned. Um, I, I don't, you know, all I know is kind of how I would approach it. And that's kind of it. I mean, you, you, I would go to the local news stations and, you know, maybe even newspapers, um and see if they have any visual support because sometimes they take home movies of that stuff too so okay sorry i couldn't be more helpful there's probably corporate media in corporate archives right this company's been sold multiple times but i would imagine that would be impossible to get i would think so that's why i thought maybe this the land survey stuff which is public domain you know um that usually is a town hall thing you know just there'll be photographs of the property uh, it won't be interesting photographs of the property, but there'll be photographs of the property. Uh, and they typically do it every you know, few decades, like every 20 or 30 years, they, they reassess uh, the land for tax purposes. So um, that's, one, that's one resource maybe you can look at. Thank you. Uh, Brianna, do you want to bring up your archival challenges and get some tips on your project? Well, the problem with my project, it's sprawling and it's huge and it's all over the place. <laughs> uh, so I think um, so it's basic. Well, okay, so it's on space. It's on the space race. Um, I just sort of finished the Cold War era, which was looking at the beginning of the space race, sort of to see how the infrastructures uh, started. Mm -hmm. And um, what I really want to work on now is Space Race 2, which is the current space race to get to Mars or any habitable planet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested in it from like a humanitarian perspective, who gets to go? And once we do have colonies, who gets to go to those colonies? Are we going to take all the inequality and all the baggage that we have on Earth with us into space? Because that's, that's basically how it is lined up right now, because there's no legislature or anything else. So it's partly legal analysis, um, but because the space race is so closely tied to the military militarization of space, and it requires such vast amounts of resources, particularly financial, but all kinds of resources. It has always only been funded by nations, at mm -hmm. least that was in the Cold War, and that's this is where the big switch is coming yeah, now. We have it's, Jeff Bezos and, uh, and uh, Richard Branson doing it instead, right? <laughs> so. Well, but they're doing it with, with um, well, Branson's a little bit less out of the game now, even even though he seems to be doing some stuff with UAE, United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. um, Virgin Galactic. But I mean, maybe that's partly because I live in the States now, where all the focus is on SpaceX. 
So there are a lot of different ways to go with it. And the military part keeps pulling me back because it's such a huge can of worms. But there's like a lot of the stuff really seems to be at the infrastructure between the, the military objective, the, the public sort of <clears throat> um, performance of what we what the, what their what the government is presenting what the ob objective is which is i don't think it's actually the true thing so <clears throat> um so you know i i have to interrupt yeah. but, but i spent the last almost two years uh doing the planetarium show at the uh hayden planetarium and i worked with you know the top astrophysicists and planetary scientists in the world on this mm -hmm. and uh so i know actually quite a bit about um oh, cool. you know these 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 things and and the scientists will tell you there are no planets that are habitable like you, you just, <laughs> there's just not there's no there's no place in this solar system that a human being can live uh without building tunnels or some kind of crazy amount of infrastructure um it's just not that that's kind of the joke right that that's what makes earth earth is it's the only place that we can live and that it's kind of a shame that we're going out of our way to destroy it um, as, as quickly as we are. Uh, space tourism, on the other hand, is a different kind of thing. As long as you can, like, you know, like Richard, what, what Virgin Galactic's doing, right? You go up for a ride and you come back, you know, that kind of thing is different. But, but going to live on Mars right now is, um, is not really, uh, we're not even remotely close to that. Well, I am working from the assumption that there are it's not an assumption it is a fact but my assumption is i don't question that we're going into space mm -hmm. we are going into space okay so my question then is under what conditions are we going into space Fair and enough. not i am not looking at space tourism i'm looking more at long-term habitation it may not take place within my lifetime right yep. this may actually be uh so like uae has a 2117 project and they're and they have the money and the resources to do this um and of course now United States is competing too. And I just saw a call actually at RPI for NASA, for proposals for projects, for mm -hmm. different infrastructure, for habitation, right? Like plant growth and uh, sustainable agriculture, like all of these things. Yes, you will have to build tunnels or some sort of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily question that we will live off earth within the next couple of hundred years. Question okay. is, how how many people are we abandoning earth that's not even part of my project right right so um so i i am definitely interested in space so this is the interesting part when you work with the cold war era right those are old archives and a lot of the stuff is so old that it's also been declassified right because the cold war is deemed over right um but the the part that i'm really excited about is the current right so and that's 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 like doing research on a constantly evolving subject yeah, yeah, yeah. um and that poses uh i guess that's kind of similar to your north carolina section that yeah. it poses a different set of problematics than looking at historical work yeah i had to draw a line in the sand somewhere right uh about how far back i was going to go because i could have gone back to reconstruction i could have gone back to you know 1868 you know or something like that but i mean you know 60 years was plenty for me, um, and I thought that I could tell the story that way. Like, where do, where do you stop? Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, currently, especially on something uh, like voting rights or like you know an evolving field, like uh, like like you know uh, current space missions, uh, it's really hard to keep chasing that to keep chasing that line. So so it's 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 more I I think if it was me and and. You know, you sort of have to stay uh, as current as is necessary, meaning like it, it sounds like you're almost doing the same kind of thing. It's sort of like a then and now thing. We have the Cold War and then we have today and, you know, what led to this? Or if we're just telling the story of this, that is a moving target, right? And yeah. so you, you, you sort of have to say, um, what is the seminal moment, right? The seminal moment when SpaceX... Uh, you know, launched the first uh, mission that docked with the ISS and successfully returned people home, right? So that's like, you know, a historical moment and I can bracket my, my thing with that. And then, you know, if you saw in my film, I had a little epilogue, you know, where like, you know, I, I kept updating. I swear to God, I was doing exactly what you're saying. Like, you know, every three weeks I would have to change that, 
you know, that little epilogue because the thing that I was talking about had updated, right, a little bit. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to do this. No, now I'm going to do that. So like when John Lewis just died, I'm like, do I have to add him to my in memoriam section? Because this becomes a problem, especially when you have custom music, because now if I make it longer, now all my musical cues are off, right? So you, you really just have to be able to, you know, like any good artist, you have to know when to put the brush down and just, and just sign it, right? So I think that, I think that, you, you know, I don't know, maybe that maybe the new, uh, the new mission to Titan that's coming up or uh, the new missions to Mars from various countries, like you were talking about, like maybe it's one of those missions landing successfully on Mars and that's, that's like your ending, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And then, and then you back into that, right? But if you... There's an extra layer since it's just an intimate conversation now. And Bibiana, I mean, I keep wanting to hear more about this, but there's the whole queer perspective and the kind of queering lens of this story. Could you talk about that? Because it really actually shifts what might be that seminal moment. Well, maybe I construct the seminal moment. Well, so there was, I was supposed to do a queer landing on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I really want to queer space and I also want to bring other people, you know, like a handicapped person, like anyone who just basically not a bunch of white men, right? Like, sorry, 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 are, not sorry. Are, are, that's okay. Are you sourcing uh, Gil Scott Heron's Whitey on the Moon? Is that going to be in your movie? Wait, what? I don't know this. Uh, Gil Scott Heron's Whitey on the Moon and Ade Nola, who was a professor at, the, at RPI in the arts department, who just passed away was in that band. He was one of the musicians. Really? Yes. So Gil Scott Heron is considered like the like like the godfather of hip hop, right? He was like a poet, um, acid jazzy kind of uh, musician who ended up being a crackhead and died. But he um, it's amazing. Dur amazing. Yeah, dur during the uh, Apollo missions, right? You know, the, the, a lot of, again, just like in my film, a lot of the same conversations we're having now, we were having then, right? Yeah. So one of Martin Luther King's, um, you know, kind of cook of his cohort, um, this guy, Ralph Abernathy, uh, would organize these protests, like we are starving in Alabama, and you're sending, you know, people to the freaking moon, like, why are we spending all this money on something so frivolous and silly when we have real problems with real people down here that maybe you know white people just don't care right and so this song this 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 uh you know, it, the song isn't quite necessarily what it was but it was more like a a, a poem to music uh was about how much suffering there was here but whitey's on the moon right and yeah. so and and that was the that was the construct right of these protests about the 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 white pride like you know it's sort of like uh, uh frederick Douglass talking about the fourth of july right it's like what does the fourth of july mean to a slave like you know what do we care about your your freedom you know so it's the same kind of construct so for the queer aspect it's kind of similar like you just said it's like you know oh we keep sending white people out into space big deal you know um you know what does that mean to me and so I think that to be more inclusive, and like you said, who gets left behind as a social construct is a really interesting tack. So that could be fun. Certainly, well, it, certainly a unique angle. I mean, it also gets complicated with the whole artificial intelligence and that UAE also is giving citizenship to artificial intelligence with feminine bodies. So <laughs> it's like really- Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, 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 it's very interesting. But they also give citizenship to falcons, so they have some interesting citizenship rules. But yeah, there, there's like so many different layers and different ways that it could go. I think I really just need to sit down and figure out. Yeah, I think I think I think it's you know, like you need to sort of there needs to be a linchpin. There needs to be uh, something that you're building this around, right? right. And if, if it if it is that moment, if it is the moment that you know, the first trans person lands on the moon, say, right? Whatever that is, if it's Krista McCullough and the Challenger, if it's, you know, whatever that is, that's gotta be your, your thing. Like, you know, I had 
the signing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, or the lead up to that, then I had the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013 that were able to work as my bookends. So that can kind of build the construct. And then of course, like you said, I had to follow these court cases in North Carolina and I didn't know how those court cases would end up, right? I mean, that, that was, I was in the middle of that. So uh, it could have gone any way it went, but I knew that the end of that court case had to be the end of my movie because I just couldn't keep going. It just didn't, you know, it was, that was a, a nice ending was whatever that ruling was going to be. So I just think that, you know, just uh, uh, narratively, I think you sort of have to have your payoff in mind, I think. So. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sure. Sounds like a great project. Thank you. It's exciting for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa Bromley, are you there? Kat, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Or Kathy? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, there you are. I'm here too. Yeah. I actually do. I do have a, a question because you talked about, uh, I, well, it's piggybacking off Steve's question and it's, I'm not a filmmaker, but I'm very interested in the archival aspect of what you're doing and how we might apply it for this um, environmental activism project. There specifically was a, a lawsuit um, in the 70s uh, that was filed against this company. And I am wondering if you have any advice on how to track down any of that paperwork, uh, like if it was filed publicly. The law firm is still around and I tried to reach out to them but couldn't get through. Um, and so I- It's tough. It's, you know, if you're dealing with government stuff, you can always file a Freedom of Information Act, you know, uh, request. And um, I've had some success with that. Uh, it's, it's a process, you, you know, you go through there. I don't know how anything works in the Trump administration because they can't, they can't do any, you know, they, they really just are inept at everything. But um, certainly prior to that, you were able to sort of issue government requests and get government responses and people took their jobs very seriously. Uh, public records, you know, they're hard. And, and, and it's really helpful to have help to do that because you, know, you can't be in every place at one time. So interns or people, like if you can wind people up and set them on a path and just give them one thing to do, uh, I find that is a really good use of people who volunteer, right? Because some people always come to me, how can I help? And I'm like, well, you know, you can go find that picture for me, you know, and I'll kind of tell them what it is that I'm looking for and they can tug on some strings and see what comes back. Um, because you know, anybody can Google, right? You can Google and hope to see it, but it only it only takes you up to that, whatever Google puts in front of you. And I think that sometimes if you know the litigants, if you know the players, you can try to look them up. You can try to find, you know, who was the expert witness in this trial? Can I find them? Do they have any documents? You know, just do a little Woodward and Bernsteining, you know, to try to find that, that thread. Uh, it's, it's, you know, most people want to talk to you, honestly. And if they have, and if they have that, uh, that document, you, oh, I've been waiting for that day when someone would ask me for these pictures, you know what I mean? So, so I think that that's not, I, I, I don't have a better answer than that. I mean, it, it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing. And it's, you know, archival research uh, assistants are really valuable people because especially someone with experience who knows how to work those databases. But if you're doing detective work, I mean, boy, you know, you just got to find out who was suing who, what law firms were involved, call them up. See, and you know, their law firms don't want to talk to you, right? They're going to say everything's confidential or whatever. Mm -hmm. They can't do that. But if anything's public record, you should be able to find it. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a lame answer, but I, I wish oh. I had a magic bullet for that. You know, we say to people that the real bottom line is to be curious, that, that curiosity is at the essence of everything, you know, of yeah. all creation. I think, I think like what we talked about yesterday that I didn't really get a chance to because I talked too much is, uh, you know, taking that first step, you know, getting off that starting line because everyone's got an idea, right? Oh, I got an idea. Oh, I got an idea. I can do it. And everyone talks about making films, but, you know, how many people actually just get off that mark and, and, and make that first interview and, and do that research and start stringing things together. It's, it's, 
you know, my hat goes off to people who, who've been doing this for, for their careers, because it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, that's, that's what I learned, right? My, my initial arrogance certainly got, got tamped down and replaced with humility and, and awe at, you know, the people who are able to, to, to make a living at this and who consistently pump out good, compelling stories. So I just uh, thought I'd follow up real quickly with this um, Norlight question. I just did a little bit of research very quickly uh, and found uh, online news footage from the local news stations. Yeah. Uh, I, I, can you just take that? I mean, uh, or do you have to make arrangements for it? Is, well, make- this is this is what I said the NBC people said, right? I mean, you can take it. Um, and if they come after you, they come after you, and then you might have to pay for it. But so a, a National Geographic photographer said to me once, and it's, it's kind of a cliche because I think I've heard it elsewhere, but he said, it's always easier to seek forgiveness than permission, right? So uh, go ahead and like, if you're going to take a picture of somebody while they're praying, like you might, you don't want to like tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, is it okay if I take a picture of you while you're <laughs> praying? Like, you, you know, you take the picture, if they get pissed, you go, oh, I'm so sorry, right? <laughs> That's it. But now you have the picture, right? So I would say slug it in, find the footage, slug it in. If you, if you can find it, use it. Um, and if they come after you, you say, oh, you know, well, first you can probably make a fair use claim for it, uh, anyway, but they're likely not going to come after you for it. I mean, the people who come after you for it tend to be like Disney because they come after you for everything. But, um, you know, I would think that you'd be able to, to use that footage. My experience has been that you don't need to worry about it as long as it's a marginal documentary that nobody sees. Or, right. If you're making too much money on it, all of a sudden people are going to want to get a piece of that, right? Well, so. sort of, it's sort of a self-defeating thing because you go ahead and use all this stuff without making arrangements for it, assuming that it's going to be, it won't be very popular. But if it does get popular, all of a sudden it's like, oh, fuck. I don't know <laughs> That's a good but problem to have, though, right? I mean, I'll take that problem. I, I, I would like my movie to get seen enough that somebody thinks it's worth suing me for. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, let's take a break. Let's try to stretch our bodies, eat something. Yeah. Um, and um, thank you, Brett, for hanging in there. Thank you, Brett. It was um, really great hearing you talk about your work. And um, yeah, Gavin, we really appreciate it. I mean, it's, I yeah. Mean, Gavin, I'm looking at that. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, you know, it's intimate, but it it, it actually is wonderful for, for us who, for being here. It's, um. I find it like such a treat to be able to just, you know, I mean, it's such intense footage. It's such an intense story. And we're going to move on to that tonight at seven. Um, But just to hear, you know, your journey is just a regular human who like, (laughs) you know, to, you know, like uh, achieve the impossible. And you did. You know what I appreciate though is a, like you're right. Nobody ever asked me about any of this stuff. And B, (laughs) I, no one, no one has yet asked me a question that I got asked a lot uh, at the beginning, but I haven't heard much lately, which is why is a white person making this story, right? And the funny thing is, is that only white people ever asked me that. Right? <laughs> the, the, the black people never once questioned why I was making this movie, yeah. but I think a lot of white executives were very uh, nervous about cultural appropriation or things of that nature, you know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. it was almost like, what right do you have to tell this story? And I was like, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know that I have an answer for that. I mean, I guess if there were uh, black filmmakers who were making this story, then that would be a different question. But uh, Reverend Barber never questioned why I was making it. Bob Moses never questioned why I was yeah. making it. You know what I mean? The people involved in the yeah. movie were very supportive of me making it. But I, I never once got asked uh, during the making of it why why it was my story to tell, you know. And um, I, I never gave it a moment's thought. Like I never, I literally never gave it a moment's thought when I was making it. It wasn't until I was done that people were questioning me. That, and I don't know that I ever really have a good answer for that question, you know. I never because it never really occurred to me. You know? I mean, my my question would be, how did you know seven years ago? that this would be such a prescient, you know, your idea was so prescient then for this film. I mean, yes, it came out a year ago, but you know, for now, it's just, 
it's just astonishing. So, it, I mean, it, let, I mean, just serendipitous, I know. It's, but. A, it's an evergreen project. It'll be just yeah. as prescient in 2024 and 2028. Well, <laughs> sadly, <laughs> sadly, yes. Okay, I hear you. Thank you for that reminder. Anyway. Assuming we get through this cycle. In one yeah, piece, right? precisely, precisely. <laughs> thank you for that, remi- that, that, that grounding. <laughs> and thank you for being here. My pleasure. It's great meeting you. Yeah. All right, I'll see you, I'll see you guys at seven, right? Yep. Awesome. Thanks. Take yeah. care. Bye. Bye.